As we all know, hepatitis B is a significant problem for, um, for globally, but uh, in North Asia in particular. And what I'll do today is that uh, we're going to hear about new therapies after my presentation, but what we're going to do in, um, at the moment is to sort of focus on um, sort of the new targets and, and what, it, what it means in terms of uh, opportunities in the next five years. Um, Professor uh, Zhu Hu Wang and I were reminiscing this morning about our age and how we're fast. He's just retired. And so um, I'm also thinking of retiring. But before I retire, I do want to have or be of the view that hepatitis B is at least almost cured. And so like with hepatitis C, what's happened is that the amazing developments with the hepatitis C DAAs has translated to a very positive flow-on effect into hepatitis B. At this point in time, I'm aware of 30 molecules and clinical studies looking at hepatitis B, new hepatitis B therapeutics. And it was great to see um, Professor Chin Ning's talk about what she's doing here in Wuhan, uh, in, in central China, in terms of just using the existing molecules that have been approved for treatment and how we can go forward in managing and, and hopefully curing our patients with chronic hepatitis B. So I think with all this excitement and a little bit of touch with a little bit of nostalgia, um, what I'll try and cover today is um, the major targets of entry. Of the top. This is more of a virological talk. Uh, entry, um, the transcriptional template, the mini chromosome, CCC DNA, also known thereof, uh, the core and the capsid inhibitors, where we are with reverse transcription, and how that will impact on what's happening here in China, and then finish up with uh, assembly and release, and maybe uh, some thoughts about the future. So there's been enormous development, and again, uh, really led by the Chinese group um, Wen Wei Li here in Beijing, who discovered NTCP as the high affinity receptor for hepatitis B. We had already known that the low affinity receptor, the receptor that the vaccine actually protects us against, the heparin sulfate proteoglycan, the low affinity receptor, is um, the probably the first attachment site for the virus coming in, and then that results in a conformational change that allows the L protein to bind to the sodium taurocholate uh, co-transporting processing polypeptide, the NTCP, and then a productive infection will ensure. Now, from this, um, we've been able to uh, reverse engineer, Stefan Urban in um, Heidelberg reverse engineered from those findings and uh, was able to develop, uh, so here is the Prius-1, but this is the Prius-1 protein here, these are the envelope proteins of hepatitis B. And you can see here that the NTCP binding site, the major one is just shown for you here, and there's an accessory um, domain just a little bit further downstream. Um, Stefan Urban has taken amino acids 2 to 48, meristillated them and they used that as a competitive inhibitor of the virus and his therapeutic is called Mercludex B. So Mercludex B uh, has gone into the clinical trial in uh, uh, Eastern Europe, mainly in Russia, and um, has shown some, some promise in, the, in, so in a group of E antigen positive patients. Numbers were small, there were only eight. Four out of the eight showed a log drop in HPV DNA in the presence of the Mercludex. So the entry inhibitors are showing some promise, but they got a, a more significant decline and a higher number when used in combination with interferon. Now the problem with Mercludex is that it's immunogenic. Being a peptide of uh, 46 amino acids that's meristillated, what's happening is that these patients are producing anti-Mercludex antibody. Now that might be a good thing or it might not be we don't know at this stage, but um, it will complicate, I think, the registration process. Now, the, the, the second target I'd like to talk about today is the mini chromosome. So if we're going to cure hepatitis B, then the, the concept of functional cure, which is S antigen zero conversion, DNA control, and uh, anti-HBS production, but still accepting the presence of CCC DNA in the hepatocyte, that's okay, but a complete or virological cure has demanded, based on the HIV model, that we eradicate all HBV DNA replicative intermediates in the infected hepatocyte, um, uh, uh, including the integrated sequences. So this is sort of, if you like, the um, uh, life cycle of hepatitis B. Here is the virus in the top left-hand corner. The genomic DNA is um, 
after it goes through the NTCP pathway, is converted into a mini chromosome of the CCC DNA. This is the transcriptional template. It makes all the viral RNAs that are necessary for the, <coughs> the viral proteins to be, to be assembled. And you get replication complexes here in the cytosol. Reverse transcription occurs and the pre-genomic RNA through a process of reverse transcription is converted into genomic DNA. It uh, interacts in a very unusual way with the envelope proteins and is actively secreted from the infected hepatocyte. Let me just get another slide to come. Um, and the, this ongoing step of reverse transcription is critical also for replenishing the pool of uh, the mini chromosome. So the argument would be that if you had profound inhibition of the reverse transcriptase step, i.e. literally 100%, though we never actually achieve that, then you would also dry up the supply, as well as blocking uh, newly replicating DNA, you would block up the supply of um, uh, precursors for the mini chromosome. Now, there have been two important discoveries in the last 18 months about how the host cell deals with hepatitis B. The first one was um, um, shown by a, um, again from the Urban group, from the Heidelberg group, that the TDP protein, which is a DNA repair um, tyrosol DNA phosphodiesterase, it recognises that the genomic DNA is a damaged molecule. And it actually repairs, uh, as part of that recognition of its damage, it actually converts, as a key uh, host cell enzyme that converts this genomic DNA into a mini chromosome. And because there's lots of gaps and nicks and um, protein bits sticking on the end of that genomic DNA. And so through that process, the conversion, it's not a, a viral step, it's a cellular step. So straight up, the host cell is recognising this DNA as foreign or as damaged, and so it wants to do something about it. The second major discovery uh, came from uh, Michael Struben in Geneva. Uh, showed, it published only just a few weeks ago in Nature that the hepatitis B X protein is a, um, uh, interacts with the host cell complex called uh, structural maintenance chromosome numbers five and six. So every time a piece of DNA enters into the nucleus, the um, host cell will chromatinize it. It will put little uh, histones and uh, other regulatory proteins associated with chromatinization on that DNA. And the goal of that process with SMC five and six is to take that invading or input DNA fully chromatinizing it and parking it somewhere in the remote corner of the nucleus so that it doesn't get uh, or do anything that it really shouldn't do. Probably it will integrate later on. So SMC56 is really critical, if you like, as an innate sensor preventing oversaturation or invasion of the host cell nucleus with viral DNAs. Now, what Michael f found was that the hepatitis B X protein completely inactivates that process. So hepatitis B X will actually inactivate SMC56 and block that step. So as the genomic DNA comes in, it's repaired by TDP2, and then um, <clears throat> the other host cell, uh, then as it makes X, it then will block SMC56 attempts to put that and put that away and park it into the vault of the of the nuclear of the uh, host cell nucleus. So really. Um, X has now become the critical target in terms of ability to sort of eradicate or remove um, or control uh, hepatitis B virus um, mini chromosomes. So we've got these two, if you like, competing pathways where you've got ongoing repair with TDP2 and you've got ongoing silencing through uh, SMC5 and 6. So what is CCC DNA? Well, CCC DNA stands for covalently closed circular DNA. This is a viral mini chromosome. For those of you who are old enough to remember the SV40 story, it's like rosary beads, they're beads on a string. And um, shown for you here is some studies that we also showed and collaborated with Thomas Box Group some years ago and showed that the hepatitis B core protein is a key component of the viral mini chromosome. So as well as TDP2 repairing it, the core protein of hepatitis B stabilizes it. So we've now got two viral targets that can manipulate or affect the viral mini chromosome or CCC DNA. The first one is the core protein and the second one is the X. So if we inactivate either the core protein or the X protein, theoretically these are two very important targets that could affect the CCC DNA and therefore our ability to truly cure hepatitis B. 
Now the other important thing is that each one of these little nucleosomes that we uh, see on the uh, rosary beads of the mini chromosome reflects a torsional state. It reflects a super twist. So for each bead, uh, you can actually put, you'll put in a, a negative super twist of 180 nucleotides. Now we did a 2D gel some years ago and demonstrated that human and woodchuck and duck HPV CCC DNA is a mini chromosome consisting of two populations of super twists, a half chromatinized, shown for you here with B1 and B2, but most importantly, this is the fully chromatinized form here, which is this group A up here. These are the ones that we believe are hit by SMC56, fully chromatinized, fully wrapped up, and stored in the remote access parts of the nucleus. So I think it's important to understand that the CCC DNA is not a single entity. It comprises of at least 21 different topoisomers that exist in two states, transcriptionally um, uh, active at half chromatinized and transcriptionally silent at fully chromatinized. These are two important concepts if we're going to understand curing hepatitis B. So here is the uh, diagrammatic model. and It hasn't really been known uh, what SMC56 does, but what we do know, it consists of a series of condensin, cohesin proteins that are a key parts of the, of the nuclear complex of the cell and are involved in chromosome topology and organisation. So it's not surprisingly then how critical SMC56 will be into the stability and the life of, of, of a mini chromosome and CCC DNA. Now, what we know is that depletion of any one of these subunits, and it's quite a complex macromolecule, Hist um, evolutionally um, conserved over a millennia, uh, results in destabilisation of this complex. And so what Mikhail Strubin did in Geneva was showing that X actually through the um, ubiquitination pathway and E3 ligase results in the um, destruction of e SMC5 and SMC6. Now we've already done the core. So as um, I think in um, Professor Chinning showed that uh, uh, in an earlier paper, again from uh, the German groups in, um, in Munich, from um, Protzen, uh, early Protz's group, that uh, the interferon pathway activates ApoBex3A, recognises the core protein bound to the CCC DNA mini chromosome, and actually uh, deaminates the uh, uracils that are uh, the, uh, th th uh, the thymidines that are there, and then that results in re repair through AP sites and degradation of the mini chromosome. She actually discovered through um, the lymphotoxin beta receptor that you get ApoBex3B will also be activated through this separate pathway. Again, ApoBex will also align itself with the core protein that's on the mini chromosome and result in um, uh, degradation through deamination of the mini chromosome. But what um, Uli found was that only half of the molecules were degraded. These are the molecules that are transcriptionally active at the time of when either the lymphotoxin beta pathway or the interferon receptor pathway are activated. So we still have work to do in terms of identified pathways that are involved in digestion and also stabilization of the mini chromosome, but we are still left with this pool of mini chromosomes where um, uh, they're parked away in the vault of the, virus, of the cell nucleus. And so this was summarized in a very elegant um, editorial in Science in relationship to, uh, uh, to Uli's paper. And you can see here, these are the two pathways through interferon or through the lymphotoxin beta pathway, which results in deamination, core dependent, and that's where the core protein is really the Achilles heel for the mini chromosome. It flags to the cell that, that's in there, and then that promotes that degradation uh, and, and possible cure for hepatitis B. Now, the other way that we can manipulate the mini chromosome or um, transcriptionally active DNA in the cell is, um, is what Ventura talked about today with HIV with in terms of epigenetic modification. We can use histone acetylase transferase inhibitors to actually manipulate the state of transcriptional activity of the viral mini chromosome. So we've already talked about different, different uh, topoisomers and their transcriptional states. Well, we know that X blocks it in this direction um, and it can be um, sort of promoted in this direction with, um, with X directly. And uh, we know that if we uh, interfere with the, hist uh, with the uh, acetylation and um, uh, and, and the, uh, the process of the uh, of stabilization of the mini chromosome, that its transcriptional activity can be con uh, controlled. So we can sort of understand that the um, nucleosomal spacing will be affected um, and also um, the transcriptional activity likewise. So 
there are certainly challenges in terms of uh, targeting CCC DNA, but we now know that there are viral proteins, X and, X and core, that clearly uh, affect the survival and the um, integrity of the mini chromosome and the transcriptional activity of the mini chromosome. Therefore, these are great targets for pharmaceutical companies to now start to have a look and try and develop small molecules to be able to block um, transcription, promote clearance and, uh, and cure. So let's have a look at the core protein because really the core protein um, that's something that we've got a lot of information of. Many years ago, the core uh, protein was actually crystallised. We know it exists as a, as a dimer. So once it's been translated in the cytosol, forms these dimers around the replication complex of pre-genomic RNA and polymerase. And so you get capsid assembly. And, uh, and the core protein, as I said, it's uh, critical for CCC DNA amplification and the stability and the maintenance of the viral mini chromosome. Now, there has been um, claims that it's important in terms of restoration of the host immune response. It affects the promoter enhancer activities of some innate uh, immune genes like ISG15, but that hasn't been confirmed. Now, Novara have just published some data last year at AASLD, and uh, they took um, fr from the crystal structure of the core protein, um, they developed a, a small molecule inhibitor uh, based on that structure, and they put it into patients, and this was done, I think, um, in, in Hong Kong, in Professor uh, M.F. Ewan's laboratory, uh, a clinical group, and they showed um, that uh, in, in the presence of, I think, 600 milligrams BD, quite a significant drop in the HBV DNA levels uh, over the 28 days of, of the treatment. Whereas you can see here, Antikavir uh, had very little effect uh, in that time frame. But um, whereas Novara, uh, the capsid compounds, and certainly in combination with interferon, was at least additive in terms of the antiviral effect. But the, the disappointing thing was that, as Professor Chin Ning has said, the important part of our treatment strategies now are trying to address S antigen clearance. Even though that he was, they were able to show significant effect on HPV DNA, there was no effect on the surface antigen. So um, I think we're going to see a lot of uh, work in progress over the next couple of years of the core active compounds in terms of uh, their ability to inhibit uh, HPV. But uh, really, I think the, the greatest hope is looking for the X inhibitors. Now, reverse transcription itself, we've always assumed that drugs like Intecavir and Tenofovir are very potent, and I think naively assumed um, almost we've overestimated their ability to inhibit HPV. And so I think that um, we, we know that there's still leakage through the replication pathway back to the intracellular conversion pathway. And so it's good to see that companies are still developing new uh, nucleoside, nucleotide analogues. And so we know that in China, for example, um, Glaxo has the rights to Tenofovir. And, uh, and I think Gilead, as they're moving into the Chinese market now, uh, are positioning this um, derivative or other pro-drug of um, Tenofovir called TAF. Uh, you can see here that it's got a significant chemical difference to, to a wild-type tenofovir or tenofovir disoproxyl, and it's got a, almost an, uh, an order of magnitude more active IC50 uh, in vitro. And I think it's currently in clinical trial here in China at the moment looking for approval. And so really there will be a big advantage because um, data presented from the Hong Kong groups, I think Henry Chan, showed that uh, it was at least as active, if not... Um, equivalent to tenofovir, but did lack the uh, kidney and the bone toxicity associated with, uh, with, with a long-term tenofovir treatment. So I think that um, we'll see TAF being marketed here in China as an alternative to tenofovir. Uh, much less drug is needed. I think it's only 30 to 40 milligrams. So I think um, we might even see some combination studies with FTC. But I think where the really the action is is what we're going to hear in the next two presentations. But really, as I said, <clears throat> if you don't really knock the S antigen down, then I think you've got to say that your new treatment has failed. And I think that's the really important message I'd like to leave you with, is that how are we going to knock down the surface antigen? And really, um, so far, the best way that we've done that is through these molecular-based therapies, transcription-driven, uh, through RNAi pathways. And Arrowhead are in phase two, and uh, there are other companies coming along in various preclinical states, but they're not really as advanced as the ARC520 Arrowhead studies. So what do we know about RNAi? Well, we can have the 
I'll just run through this stepwise by step. RNA, double-stranded RNA um, is processed through, uh, through the DICER apparatus. It's cleaved into the various little 19 to 21 double-stranded nucleotides. It is handled through the RISC uh, apparatus, which results in strand amplification and uh, appropriate pairing to the messenger RNA of interest. This results in cleavage of that RNA, and this RNA is then degraded, and that gives you selective gene silencing. So what you started out with, you can target a particular gene or region with a, a synthetic double-stranded RNA molecule, and then it's processed through this directly into uh, the risk apparatus, which results in therapeutic silencing. So I'll just very briefly, because this will be discussed in the next presentations, when ARC520 was um, put into E antigen positive patients, some of them naive, and in combination with Antikovir, we were able to, they were able to achieve a nearly two log reduction in surface antigen as a direct acting antiviral agent. <clears throat> now this is the first time that any agent has directly inhibited surface antigen and it's based purely on, the, on a direct acting antiviral effect. This effect lasted just one, in, one dose here, achieved a, quite a significant knockdown and it lasted for uh, almost 60 days. So I think, um, as I said, we'll hear a lot more detail about this in the next presentations, but really this is an exciting landmark paper that um, I'm sure um, will hopefully lead, um, <coughs> lead us forward in terms of our ability to control hepatitis B. The thing that the other important, as well as actually being able to show specific S antigen reduction, I think the other in thing that was intriguing about the Arrowhead studies was that they showed a difference between E antigen positive and E antigen negative hepatitis B. And the virologists have always suspected that there's very significant pathophysiological differences between the two. And um, what liver biopsy data in terms of a chimpanzee study that was done before the clinical trial started and then was uh, then investigated with deep sequencing of the RNA that um, what the, the conclusion from these studies from Robert Lanford's group in Texas was that most of the HPV DNA in the liver of the E antigen positive chimps was actually as CCC DNA, <coughs> uh, as, a, as a mini chromosome. But in the E antigen negative ample, in animals, this was 500 fold less. And in fact, only 5% of the total DNA in these E antigen negative animals was actually a mini chromosome or CCC DNA. And that um, and the total HPV DNA levels were not affected by the nukes. That implies that this is integrated. So it's like as if you go from E antigen positive to E antigen negative, the rate of integration changes dramatically. And the, and the dynamic mixture between the mini chromosome, genomic DNA and integrated DNA is very different in E antigen positive and E antigen negative disease. And I think that's going to be something that we'll be discussing a lot over the next year or so. So the key virological findings for ARC520, the first time we've seen a direct antiviral effect on serum surface antigen. Uh, they also demonstrated a direct effect on E antigen of more than one log, and also the core related antigen, which was done in um, Professor Ewan's laboratory. These were all significant, uh, as I said, between one and two logs. That E antigen positive and E antigen negative chronic hepatitis B <coughs> have very different viral pathophysiologies. And this has important, obviously, therapeutic and prognostic significance as we go forward in our clinical trial design. Now, the last um, target that we're looking at at the moment is assembly and release. And there's been these um, nucleic acid sort of homopolymers called REP9A 2139. And they're really strange macromolecules, these nucleic acid polymers, that seem to bind in a very charge-dependent way surface antigen. They probably also affect... Uh, the receptor sites through HSPG and NTCP. The, the trouble is these, tr these studies have been done in very unusual parts of the world. They've been done in Bangladesh, uncontrolled, and also in other parts of the world where there doesn't seem to be a great deal to clinical practice GMP. And so even though the data claimed has been spectacular, it really uh, would require independent validation before we went too, got too far excited about the whole process. So really, I'd like to start, I'll just, I haven't quite finished yet, but um, just to summarise where we're at with new targets, the goalposts are shifting. We're really seeing significant developments with the molecular-based therapies. I think the medium-term aim for the field is to achieve a functional cure, S antigen zero conversion, uh, S loss, and anti-HBS production. We're seeing over 30 new agents coming through on hepatitis B, 
and the, the identification of the receptor will really be um, has empowered the virologist to be able to look for new targets and, uh, and, new, and new drugs. Um, so I guess to be fair, where are we with the immune-based therapy? We heard from Professor Ning today that there's, she's been able to sort of take existing approved drugs and really um, show synergy at least uh, with some of those compounds. But um, I'll just share some data with uh, this coming out on the the most sophisticated therapeutic hepatitis B vaccine ever made was this GS474, and it has completely failed in the clinic under every possible permutation and combination. So the therapeutic vaccines have been so far, uh, this is about the fifth one that I'm aware of that's completely failed, and really the company's going away to have a bit of a rethink about what went wrong. I mean, not, not one patient actually showed any benefit from the therapeutic study. Um, and I think the main problem is that was alluded to again by Professor Ding today is the impact of the surface antigen. And this is something that we've really got to be more aggressive about in our discussions in terms of treatment. Just to remind you, when I first became a fellow 30 years ago, what my boss told me is that surface antigen is secreted in vast excess over virions by sometimes three or four orders of magnitude. It circulates in the blood at enormous concentrations, often up to 400 micrograms per mil. That's an enormous burden. One to two percent of the total serum protein is hepatitis B surface antigen. This is what we use to make the first generation vaccine. But the thing that strike, strikes me as most amazing about this protein is that there's nothing like it in the database. It has eight cysteines shown here in the, uh, the reds and eight prolines. And this results in enormous amount of, sh of rafting and um, conformational dependence that uh, is really unique in biology. It also has four trans transmembrane domains over this very short area of 50 amino acids. So to have these 16 amino acids of cysteines and prolines, four transmembrane domains, really puts it into a class all of its own. But what's really important is, again, from uh, Professor Ewan's group in Hong Kong showed, again, that the persistence of surface antigen past the age of 50, irrespective of S antigen loss, is associated with a significantly increased risk of ACC in the absence of S loss. But if you lose S before the age of 50, then that, that cancer risk was reduced um, <clears throat> to, to a very, very, very low level. So it obviously does have an oncogenic role. It plays a key role in persistence. And as Professor Ning showed today, it's imp certainly important in terms of uh, immune modulation. So here is, this is what the A determinant looks like in another sort of map. Um, and what we've done in my laboratory is um, sort of uh, taken um, 19 amino acids and been able to interrogate the structure of this unique, unique det um, determinant, the A determinant of the surface antigen. And these 19 amino acids have been put into a bioplex platform which allows you to interrogate in real time the shape and the um, uh, epitopes of those 19 amino acids in the context of this unique protein. And what that gives you, <coughs> so here is the design of assay number one. This allows, this is the bioplex platform. 19 different amino acids are put onto these different beads. Uh, we capture the surface antigen in that right epitope and then sort of each bead has got one particular monoclonal so that you know the particular profiles, epitope positioning, gaining or lossing accordingly. The other assay that we built in, 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 in parallel to this was based on um, an observation that we started to see from the, um, from the Gilead um, Tenofovir 103 registration trial was that there's sometimes in, in, in patients free circulating anti-HBS. So we designed an assay that has the ability to measure anti-HBS coexisting and co-circulating in the presence of excess surface antigen. So we have these two assays, an assay that measures the epitope change or the shape, shape shift of the surface antigen and the ability to sort of measure antibody to that same region at the same time in the coexisting surface antigen positive patients. And the Tenofovir 103 trial was exceptional because there were 20, so there were 14 of the 24 patients actually had S antigen zero conversion in the first 12 to 14 months of the study and actually experienced a functional cure. And um, we were very interested in these 14 patients. And what we showed was that using that uh, bioplex assay that I just showed you, that we were able to define a clearance profile. In these patients, they make a unique antibody to the um, uh, epitopes to those, um, that A determinant, uh, to loop one and loop two of the A determinant. Now, in those patients that uh, were matched for genotype and uh, 
no response or no clearance profile or no S antigen change, there was uh, no ability or, 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 no, or no production of the clearance profile. So what we were able to show and confirm later on in the Arrowhead studies was that um, for patients who actually uh, seroconvert, that we were able to show a significant association with the developments of this clearance profile, loop one and loop two changes, a significant decline in S antigen and, and or a seroconversion profile with a positive predictive value of over 80%. And so I think that for the first time we're now starting to get an insight into the importance of the roles of B cells and the humoral response in terms of eradicating HPV. So my last slide will be looking something like this. What would a hepatitis B curative regimen look like? And of course, we, we, we were always compelled in the past to say a potent nucleoside or a nucleotide. We've got to knock out the CCC DNA. We've got to do something about that surface antigen. And really, we always want to add in something immunological. But I'd put it to you that we don't need that. That I believe, like, like with hepatitis C, if we control the virus and its products, we may very well see the ability of the host to recover and spontaneously clear the hepatitis B virus. Thank you very much.